All right, welcome everybody to our uh, NGTS Next Generation Transportation Systems Seminar, which is also part of the TFDC Traffic Flow Theory Committee webinars series. Today, we are honored to have two distinguished guest speakers, Dr. Guido Cantelmo and Dr. Sergio Batista. Uh, they'll present their latest research findings on activity-based dynamic traffic assignment on regional networks and aggregated traffic models. Sergio is a postdoc at NYU Abu Dhabi right now. He did his PhD at the University of Lyon in France, and Guido is a Assistant is an assistant professor at Technical University of Denmark in Copenhagen, Den Denmark, and he did his PhD at the University of Luxembourg, and he was a postdoc before joining University of Technical University of Denmark in TU Munich, right, Guido? Yeah. So if you have any questions at the end of the session, at, at the end of the presentation, you can ask your questions. Just raise your hand and ask your questions. Or if you have any questions during the presentation, you can write them down in the chat section. So with all that said, the floor is yours. Guido, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Rafek, uh, for inviting us today to talk about uh, our latest research. And despite the very complicated title, title actually the presentation is about simplified models. So it doesn't look like. So today we're gonna talk about uh, the research we have been doing with Sergio and with many other people actually, and is about a simplified activity-based model and a simplified traffic model and how we can combine them together to try to make uh, some analysis, basically. But before entering into the, uh, the core of the presentation, I'll just like to spend one minute talking about mobility in general and why it is so difficult actually to deal with mobility and to model transportation systems. Well, we all know that the last two years have been pretty challenging and a lot of things uh, changed. And so let's start perhaps from there. If we just set our clock back a couple of years to 2019, it's not going. Yeah, the situation uh, in 2019 was looking pretty different from today. So when we talked about mobility, everything was about mobility as a service, uh, car sharing, car hailing, Everything was focusing a lot about the sharing economy and sharing system. And it looked like this was really a hot topic and this was gonna play a central role in all the, uh, the in, in mobility in the upcoming years. And then just one year after, the situation looks completely different. Now, the new big thing is working from home. A lot of companies since 2020 are considering now making this option permanent. And of course, there is a lot of there are a lot of consequences in terms of mobility. Um, for instance, there are uh, there is going to be less people commuting eventually. There are going to be there is going to be relocation of activities. People are going to change their life habits. So everything changed in only a couple of years. And if we look at the at the trips of Uber, for instance, for the first time in in many many years, Uber actually has seen a decrease in the number of trips. So the question is how the mobility of tomorrow is going to look like. Is going to everything go back to what was before or is going to be like today or is going to be something different? And, and I think this is the central question. We don't know how the mobility of tomorrow will look like. What we do know is that it's going to be different from the mobility of today. And we know that there are a lot of new services and a lot of new technology that is finding its way, to, its way to the market. We have autonomous vehicles, mobility as a service, connected vehicles, all these technologies, all these service is slowly being implemented. Some of it is already on the market and will provide the users to, with some new options. And all these services promise to solve all mobility problems. But we know as, as, as technical people that this is not necessarily true. So the question is, how can we really exploit this technology to solve trans transportation problem? And the idea is that we need to focus on the link between technology and travel behavior. Every time that we provide users with a new service, with a new option, they're gonna change their behavior. 
They are going to eventually change their transport modes. They are going to change the location of some activities, the time of certain activities, or perhaps they are not going to change at all what they do. And this is probably not what we had in mind when we provided a new service. So the question is, how can we link whatever type of service we introduce in the market to the behavioral change that they trigger? And this is the topic that we're going to talk about today. Now, of course, there are already a lot of models that deal with user behavior, and they are extremely good. We can model pretty much everything, but many models are extremely complicated. And the same goes for traffic model. We can model autonomous vehicles. We can model pretty much everything. But of course, also in this case, traffic models can become very complicated. And the, and the, the research point here is we cannot just making things complicated all the time. If we take a very complex model for behavior and a very complex model for traffic, and we combine them together, we cannot always expect to have good results. So today, we try to look at a way of simplifying the problem, how we can have a simplified behavioral model, a simplified traffic model, and how can we maybe do some analysis and understand behavioral changes by combining these two frames. So this is the uh, layout of the presentation. We started already with a little bit of motivation. Then I'm now going to uh, talk about the simplified activity-based framework. And then Sergio is going to take over and talk about MFD. And we are going to look at some results of how we combine this activity-based framework with the uh, macroscopic fundamental diagram. So let's start from the simplified activity-based framework. First of all, as we are talking about the simplified model, is really asking us to keep it simple. So we are not going today to look at individual mobility. We are not going to see individual users, but we are going to focus on an aggregated representation of the demand, mostly origin destination demand flows. So flows of people moving from one zone to another in the city. And thanks to new technology, we actually can now uh look at how the, the, the mobility demand looks like we can observe flows moving across the network from one origin to one destination and what we know already is that they looked extremely uh complex it's it's not a profile that we can model with a simple function for instance with a polynomial function it's very difficult to interpret what's happening of course we know that there are double there are two peaks often related to morning and evening commute but it's really, really difficult to just have an immediate understanding of what, what's happening just by looking at the demand. So a few years back, we, we had uh, an hypothesis with some colleagues, which is perhaps if we divide the demand in primitives, and if each primitive is representing an homogeneous group of users, for instance, people going to work in the morning, then perhaps we can actually represent people with these similar characteristics with only a few parameters. For instance, if we only isolate people going to work, then perhaps we can model them as uh, with few parameters. So the average departure time and maybe the variance of the departure time. And perhaps we can do this reasoning for all different demand segments. And what happened is that we took a closer look to the data uh, and we observed actually this was the case. If we actually divide the demand into segments of, let's say, homogeneous users, so users with similar preferences or belonging to the same uh, demand segment, then we observe a quite smooth shape. And we can use, for instance, probability functions to represent this profile in a very simplified way. So that was the first step. But actually, it comes that we can do something far better than that. We can actually, instead of using any probability functions, we can use utility theory to model the probability of performing a certain activity. How does this work? Well, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Each location in the network and each activity in the network, for instance, work, grocery, education, is associated with the utility function, which says how useful is for each user to be in a certain place at a certain time. How useful is for you to be here today. And then we just calculate the probability by assuming that the user maximizes their utility. You are more likely to be where you where it's useful for you to be. 
So depending on how useful for you is to be in one place or in the other, uh, we can calculate the probability of you moving at some time during the day. And of course, this comes from the literature. There is a lot of work with utility functions. And the very great things of this is that solves a lot of problems for us. First of all, now we can distinguish between different activities, which means when we observe the, the, the flow traveling from one origin to one destination, we can see that there are different users. There are workers, and perhaps there are people doing something else. And when we are going to, for instance, introduce a toll or introduce any type of measure, we know that they are going to answer in a different way. Not only, we can also differentiate for the same user different type of behavior. The same user is behaving differently if he's going to work or if he's going home. And last but not the least, we can use this representation to include not only trips, but actually chain of activities. We can track then all movements of people from going home, from leaving home in the morning to return home in the evening. And all of this just using, let's say, let's quote unquote, few utility functions. So if we look a little bit more careful to the equation, uh, what we are trying really to model here is the total utility over the day. It's not just the utility of being here now, but it's all the utility of joining all the activities that you do during the day. So we can say that the, our utility function, hopefully you can see my mouse, is given by two terms. One term is the utility of performing a certain activity at a certain time. And this utility function only depends on the time of the day at least in a simplified way. And the other term is the disutility of travel, which is basically how what's the negative effect of traveling at some time during the day. And the nice thing is that the disutility of traveling, it doesn't depend also only on the time of the day, of course, but it depends on the mode of transport and on the route choice. So in a natural way, utility function allow us to expand from activities to actually many other different levels of the choice dimension. So in one simple function, we have root choice, we have mod choice, and we have departure time choice. So we can actually measure changes in travel behavior in, in the reaction of the users at many different levels. Now, of course, we have to remember one very important thing, that we started saying that the demand is very complex when we started to decomposing into, into primitives. And it's not that like now the demand became simple. It's just that now all this complexity is included in these utility functions. And the fact that we can understand them doesn't, doesn't mean that it's easy to understand them. And let's make an example. Let's say that we want to do the simplest possible case. We want to model the homework commute for this network. So no, no root choice, no mod choice, only the part time choice. Now, the utility of the homework commute, let's say, leaving uh, home at 7 o'clock in the morning and returning at 4 in the afternoon, is given by this equation on the bottom. So your utility is function of your departure time, 7 and 4 in the afternoon, and you have five utility functions. Utility of staying home in the morning, utility of traveling at 7, utility of work, utility of traveling at 4 in the afternoon, and the utility of staying home in the, in the evening. And let's pay attention to this. The utility of being home in the evening and in the morning is different. It's extremely different. So here is where the, the complexity is entering into the game again. What do these utility functions look like? And what parameters do they have? This is another way to look at the same example as before. But instead of looking at the network, we are looking at the utility function. So in this case, you can see that the first curve is the utility of being home. Then you have some time in which the user is traveling, and we can compute a negative component there. We have the utility of being at work. We have some travel time again, and then the utility of being uh, at home in the evening. So first question, who is telling us that the utility functions look like this? Well, as a matter of fact, nobody. And as a matter of fact, there is an infinite way of representing utility functions. They could be constants. They could be bell-shaped. They could be logarithmic trend. And there are in the literature infinite amount of, of utility functions. And even in this case, we decided, well, OK, it's the bell-shaped one, fine. This is the same function, but of course, each activity has very different parameters. Who is telling us these parameters? Of course, I could tell you, well, we get them from travel survey, but the whole idea here is to simplify. So 
that's not going to work. We, we, we have to find a different way. What happens if we don't have travel survey? Then we cannot run the model. That would not be very useful. And finally, let's look at the, uh, the way we can we compute probability for it. Well, uh, given our utility functions, for one second, we assume that all parameters are given. Then we can get the probability as a simple logic formula in which our decision variable is the departure time, uh, time in the morning and time in the evening. So even for this simple example, however, we have a lot of problem because the, the number of, uh, of decision variables will increase too fast. In this case, if we only consider five time interval in the morning and five time interval in the evening, you will have 25 possible alternatives. And the number increases very fast when you provide more alternative to, to the users. And more alternative, it means that you will have to run your model more and more times, and eventually it will become impossible. Additionally, this is the homework commute. If you start including additional activities, then the number of decision variable increase even more. We have been talking about the part of time. If we also start about more choice and root choice, then the problem explodes even faster. On top of it, people might decide to cancel their activities altogether. And finally, once again, we have to consider that we need to somehow get the parameters for this utility function, not only initialize them. So also defining the utility function is a challenge that we have to address. Otherwise, the, the whole concept of using this function doesn't make sense if we have no consistency between our traffic model, our demand, and our utility functions. So answer or try to answer most of these questions in the remaining few slides. First of all, I'm going to give one big trick for dealing with utility functions, which is, as we mentioned, that there is an infinite number of utility functions, almost. There is a very huge amount of functions that have been proposed. But there is one key difference among all of them. Some of them include the duration of the activity, and some of them do not. And this is a key difference. Uh, so if we use a function that doesn't account duration, it means that the utility of being in some place at some time, it doesn't depend on what time you arrive. For instance, the utility of, of attending this meeting today is not influenced on the fact that you arrive at the university at five o'clock in the morning or at 12. It doesn't matter. You are going to enjoy or hate yourself the same for being here at this time. And this is a fundamental difference because if we assume that if we don't use duration, then we can say that the utility functions are separable, which means each, the, each decision can be modeled as independent. You can model what are the choice in the morning and the choice in the evening as independent decisions. And this is going to simplify the problem enormously. So with all this information, the simplified behavioral model will look something like that. We start from any type of demand model we have. It could be a synthetic population, an activity-based model, really whatever. And then we group users into a group of users with similar characteristics. For each of them, we create an origin destination matrix of users who have who belong to the same demand segment. For instance, we will have one matrix for the home or work commute, one for education, one for private activities, and one matrix for each activity you want to model. Then you can have a departure time choice in which you create you represent the temporal decision of traveling at some time. And with this, you will finally get a dynamic matrix for each activity, and you can then aggregate them into your overall demand. Now, uh, this is the same result as the traditional dynamic, let's say, representation of the demand. The difference is that now, once again, you have information on the fact that you have different users traveling at the same time on the same route. And you also can represent that when you make a change, for instance, you introduce, a, you introduce a toll or you make any type of intervention, these users might react differently, which is the old key. Now, there is still one big question that I'm answering, which is, OK, but how do we calibrate the utility functions? I mean, all the complexity has been moved from the profile to the utility functions. So how do we get the, the, those, right, those values right? 
And also, let's not forget that here, the same utility function could be different for different locations. If you try to model working in an area of the city or in another area of the city, that's going to be different. So we are not going to talk too much about the models that we have been used, but with, uh, with some of my colleagues, we, we actually try to address this question. And what we did is to use aggregate traffic data to solve this, the, the, this problem. So one approach is to use demand estimation. So what we did is to use traffic counts and uh, traffic speeds to calibrate the utility functions. How do we do that? Well, it's actually simple. We combine this simplified model with the traffic model. In this case, was Bism. We created, created a priori uh, a guess of the number of users and a guess of the utility functions. And then we corrected them. We corrected both the number of users and the parameters of the utility functions in order to reproduce the traffic data that we had so that we could be sure that we have utility function that allow us to replicate whatever our model, our data were suggesting us. Uh, this worked actually very well, but it's not very practical. And the reason is that when we talk about activities, it makes sense when we are talking about 24 hours. We can do it for shorter time interval, but of course, when you think about your activities, you usually are thinking about 24 hours. What, what am I going to do today? Not what I'm going to do during the next hour. I mean, okay, you also do that, but activities take place over 24 hours. And running a dynamic model for 24 hours, it's at the very least time consuming, perhaps unfeasible, depending on the model and on the size. So, another approach that we use is to use an entirely data driven approach. So, we can take observations about the demand, which could be GPS data, but could also be uh, mobile phone network data and or an historical demand metrics for which you don't have activities. And then you can simply calibrate the utility functions that are more likely to reproduce the demand that you are observing. So this is an entirely um, data-driven approach, which doesn't require actual simulation. And just a couple of concluding remarks. Uh, the good thing of this model is that it's flexible. It allows to model different activities and the fact that different activities do look different. For instance, here we are looking at the duration obtained with the model for several activities. And for instance, work is actually two peaks, as you can see, you have, because you have part-time job and real-time job. And other activities like shopping or leisure, they have a sort of logarithmic trend. You have the tendency to spend a little, I mean, you have the tendency to don't spend eight hours doing, uh, doing shopping. Usually the first hour is the most uh, useful, and then the utility of being in the shop decrease quite fast. And the last but not the least, as we started talking about the fact of including different types of choices, once that you, we have identified the different parameters of the utility function, then we can actually very easily understand also, uh, do also the mod choice. Because once that we have the parameters and we have calibrated the utility functions, then we can actually fairly easy also apply the same model to mod choice, for instance, because the calibration is one of the most demanding part of the entire problem. So this is another experiment in which uh, we apply the same concept, not only to identify activities, but also to split the demand by mode of transport. And that's pretty much it for the simplified uh, activity-based model, let's call it this way. Uh, and there is actually one main, very important takeaway, a remark that I would like to make. Uh, of course, we have been talking about um, a lot of problems uh, and a lot of uh, how important it is to model choice. But there is one important thing that is important, which is uh, utility functions in general. And specifically, to model the uh, positive component of the utility is fundamental when we work with traffic. For a very practical reason, every time that we run a traffic model to simulate congestion, and we don't consider basically the fact that users are going somewhere, then we are assuming that users have nothing better to do than being stuck in congestion. And under this assumption, it's not surprising to see that you will have queues that are much longer than in reality, because in reality, you have better things to do than being stuck in the queue. And that's why it's not only a matter of reproducing better, reproducing better choices is not just about reproducing activities, 
or reproducing the choice, but it's also to have more realistic traffic, even with the state of the art models. And I think this is most of it for my part. Sergio, maybe I'm gonna give you the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Guido. So in this presentation, we are going to basically try to couple this work that Guido presented to you in the previous slides with the MFD-based models. MFD stands for the Macroscopic Fundamental uh, Diagram. So starting just with a brief introduction to these uh, models. Can you go to the next slide? So we start from the definition of our uh, city network in which we have the definition of links. So basically our streets uh, and to apply the MFD based models, we need to partition our city uh, into a set of regions. Um, as you can see here by the partitioning and this will allow us to have a simplified version or simplified vision of our uh, network which we can call as an aggregated network or simply regional network because we will, we will be talking about uh, regions. And as you can see, the, the nodes of this aggregated graph represent the regions and the connections between two adjacent regions actually depend on the allowed travel directions between two adjacent regions in the uh, urban network uh, itself. Uh, so, and can you go to the next slide? In, the, in each region, we assume that uh, traffic conditions are approximately homogeneous and they can be uh, regulated by the so-called macroscopic fundamental diagram. So this is just a sketch uh, to show you that what is true uh, for a link in which we have the fundamental diagram, uh, we also have it for a set of links where we assume that uh, traffic conditions are approximately homogeneous. What does this homogeneity mean? It means that vehicles will be traveling at the same average uh, speed. So uh, can you go to the next? So uh, in terms of uh, modeling, uh, in each region, uh, traffic states are modeled by an aggregated variable or state variable called accumulation. And the accumulation of vehicles is just the number of vehicles that will be traveling inside a given region at a given uh, time uh, instant. Uh, and how uh, traffic is modeled? Well, traffic, uh, or the, in, in, in this case, the accumulation in, this, in, in a given region R uh, is given by this uh, conservation equation, which is just the inflow minus the outflow. So basically the vehicles that are going in minus the vehicles that are going out. So this is in a simplified uh, version um, of the model. And the MFD is just similar to the fundamental diagram is a relationship between the uh, average circulating flow in the region and the average uh, density. And you can translate this relationship into production versus the accumulation or the circulating speeds versus the accumulation. So move on, next. So now that we have this network, that we have a way to model the, our, uh, to mimic the traffic conditions in our uh, network, in our regional network, uh, we need to tell people if you are going from this origin to this destination, and here origin and destinations, they stand for uh, regions. So people that are traveling from one region in the city to another region, we need to define uh, paths. So, so how people will move uh, in this network. Please go to the next. And uh, here we uh, have to introduce not only uh, a new definition of path, but also how to characterize uh, these paths. So as you can see uh, here in figure uh, A, we have different trips in the city and trips in the city, it, they are just represented by the sequence of travel links, or in this case, uh, of traveled uh, routes or sequence or, or fractions of uh, different streets in uh, our city. Uh, and these uh, trips, each trip, uh, it's just a sequence of links and each link has a fixed uh, physical length. When we uh, have a macroscopic vision of these trips in the city, so basically when, when you put the, the on top of our city and of our trips, um, di distributions of travel distances. Can you go to the next? 
So the first is how to define, uh, the first step is how to define paths, as I was explaining to you in a previous slide. So we have trips and we just filter, uh, we just check what are the sequence of traveled regions by these trips following the definition of the partitioning as it is exemplified here from the left to the right, where you can see uh, how these trips how these uh, trips are transformed into paths into our regional uh, network. And here we distinguish between a regional path and the regional path is just a sequence of traveled regions uh, where the origin and destination, uh, they are different. Then an internal path. An internal path is just a trip that, uh, a path or, or a travel that occurs inside the same region. So basically the origin and destination are the same and people just travel inside the same region. Can we go to the next? So the next question is how to characterize uh, also these travel distances? Well, since we are filtering these trips um, by the sequence of travel distances to gather the paths, we can also have um, access to each individual travel distance of each trip that will be linked to the same path. And this uh, information will be used to um, gather an explicit distribution of travel distances to characterize um, the, poss the possible travel distance of each path in each uh, region that it travels, which is represented here by this uh, scheme. Can you go to the next? Term? So now the question becomes when we are going to do to model route choices. Um, we have to calculate a network equilibrium. So we are going to target the user equilibrium where users uh, aim, in this case, to minimize their uh, path travel time. So contrarily to what we have in the classical uh, DTA problems in which we have the link definition, here we have something, uh, a new definition of path where the travel distances are no longer fixed. So we have a distributions, uh, we have distributions of travel distances. On the other hand, we also have the traffic dynamics that are given by the speed MFD and how we are going to uh, calculate the user equilibrium uh, on uh, regional networks. Next, please. So here we have to notice that uh, the travel time instead of being a ratio between a fixed uh, travel distance divided by the traffic dynamics, so basically the, the mean speed in the region, uh, we have an explicit distribution of travel distances divided by the spatial mean speed in the region. And here we'll be uh, targeting the uh, deterministic user equilibrium. So basically the travel times will just be given by the average uh, of the distribution LRP and of the uh, mean speed. Um, and we, uh, to calculate the user equilibrium, we also assume, so given a simulation time uh, capital T here in this figure at the bottom, we are going to um, utilize a quasi-dynamic approximation to determine the network equilibrium. So this means that we split our total, total simulation time into smaller intervals uh, of five minutes, for example, and during which we are going to calculate the equilibrium uh, conditions. And we go then to the next uh, time step and the next, the initial point of the next time step uh, will depend on what happened in the previous time step. And we utilize the classical method of uh, successive averages to calculate here um, the network equilibrium, because uh, here we have simplified our network um, and this method uh, works uh, well for the convergence. Um, next. So now that we have uh, our framework to model departure time and activities and also path choices uh, in terms of our regional network, how do we couple everything together in our MFD uh, modeling? Next, please. So this is just a general overview of how uh, everything is uh, coupled uh, together. So we start from our inputs. We assume that the definition of the network partitioning is given. 
We also need to know a set of trips uh, in the network uh, to, the, to the, um, gather the paths and their travel distances in our regional network. Uh, we assume that we have the calibrated MFT functions, the set of activities, and we know how many people are traveling from one origin one regional origin to one regional uh, destination. So the green uh, dashed box represents just the departure time, uh, the activity-based departure time uh, equilibrium. And uh, here the blue box uh, will be uh, the part of the path choices. Um, so given the inputs, we have a first initial period in which we assign people uh, in the network, so for their departure time. And then we are going to uh, look on their, uh, trying to model their uh, path uh, choices. And here the red box will just uh, represent the, um, the quasi static or quasi dynamic uh, user equilibrium uh, calculation. So we'll just basically be iterating uh, in this uh, red box um, for the total simulation. Uh, period until we achieve the user economy in all of them. And then we have a choice if we want to update or not uh, the paths according to the traffic dynamics. So in our work, we have decided not to update them. So basically our paths are given initially, the paths on the regional network. This uh, blue box that represents the um, user equilibrium conditions in terms of uh, path choices will give us the travel time per OD pair that we will utilize to update the travel times um, in the activity-based departure time choice. Um, and then once we have uh, converge in terms of departure time, we finish our uh, simulation. So th this is just a brief overview of how everything is uh, interconnected uh, together. Uh, do you want to add something here, Guido, about your departure time model? No, I think it's uh, the, the overview shows everything. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so next. So now we are going to test uh, this framework on the Innsbruck uh, network, Innsbruck network uh, in Austria. So that you see here on top, we partition this network into uh, four regions. So this means that we have 16 possible uh, OD pairs, and we have calibrated uh, different MFT functions. So we assume just a bit parabolic uh, shape. And we are going to discuss three different uh, scenarios. So we start by uh, scenario number one. If you can move to the next slide. Yeah, maybe I want just to add something at this point. Okay. It came out to mind. First of all, sorry, before I was going, uh, you were talking about next time interval, I was going to the next slide. But no, I just want to say that maybe an important thing for whoever is uh, a little bit um, uh, also uh, aware of these type of models that use utility functions is that what really we are trying to do with this framework at this stage is that this type of utility function have been already used a lot in the past, but have been used with very simple model. And the, the mother of all the, the part of time choice models based like that is the bottleneck model of VCRA. Uh, and there were a lot of generalization with activities and with general network, but uh, that's a model that doesn't work for general network. So what we are really trying to do in these experiments is actually to see if we can use, M in a certain sense, MFD as a generalization of these models that were simplified uh, behavioral model that come from basically uh, transport economics. And therefore, yeah, maybe we can move below, but this is exactly what you see in this case, the old network of Innsbruck has been uh, simplified in four regions. And therefore with only four regions and the regional network, we can easily run the departure time choice, the root choice multiple times. And even 24 hour simulation is, gone, is not gonna take forever because, well, you can see that the network from I don't remember how many nodes it became four nodes. So the the, the scale. Uh, this network it has I think four thousand around four thousand nodes. So uh, there you go. Around from, two thousand links if I'm so not mistaken. From four thousand nodes we simplify to four regions. So the the convenience in terms of computational time and how many different scenarios and options we can model. That's that's where we are really trying to exploit the MFT. 
And on the other hand, uh, by simplifying also the network, uh, we have a, count a countable number of paths. So basically we can do path enumeration in a, such a small uh, aggregated network. This is the other advantage also in terms of uh, the route choice or the path choice for these uh, sort of aggregated models. Uh, and we'll see that uh, what we are going to model is just basically people traveling from one origin to one destination in the city. And in this scenario uh, one, we have just two OD pairs uh, with six paths in which we have considered two different demand levels. So the solid curves, they represent um, just uh, sort of free flow states uh, or less congestion in, in the network. And then we have for a second uh, demand level, increase the uh, level of congestion in the network. And here in the, on, on top, we see uh, just our desired demand. So this represents how the demand uh, evolves or, or, or the demand as function of their um, desired departure time. We run our uh, experiment, so basically our uh, model, uh, we can call it, I think, activity-based uh, MFT our modeling <laughs> uh, or our framework. And we see that at equilibrium, the demand tends to flatten around the, the peak for the desired departure time choice, which is consistent to what we uh, have also in the bottleneck model. Um, do you want to add something here, Will? I think it's uh, this is good. It's just to say that this is exactly what we usually expect according to the literature when using this sort of utility functions. And that's exactly what we were mentioning before, that when the moment in which you start considering utilities, then you will have that uh, instead of having people queuing and having a very long queue, you will have this, the tendency to see that the, actually the, 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 the demand has a tendency to flatter and to, much, to exploit much better the infrastructure than if we don't consider the utilities, if you don't consider this dimension of the choice. Should and we go to the next slide? Yeah, and here we, we can also observe another thing that is very important, which is the more we load vehicles in the network, so the more conjecture the network would tend to be initially, and this can be seen by the dash lines, this is when our model will actually act uh, more to flatten these curves around the peak. And you clearly observe that these peaks are more flattened for the more conjecture network than the free flow case. So basically the dash lines compared to the solid lines. Yeah, next slide. So this of course has an influence in terms of the path uh, choices. So we see that uh, on the left, we have the path choices for um, scenario one when the network is not uh, so conjectured. So which were basically just the, the solid lines. And we observe that uh, people between, so between the user equilibrium and the activity-based uh, user equilibrium, we don't have really an influence in terms of the path choices. More, uh, so the, the, the small flattening that we have observed in the equilibrium demand compared to the desired demand uh, comes from the departure time choice. However, when conjection comes into play, so when we start uh, arriving to the capacity of the MFD or the capacity of the network, this is when we are going to have an interaction between, so basically a change in between the user equilibrium conditions in which we have no modeling of activities and the activity-based user equilibrium uh, in which we consider also the departure time choice and modeling of activities. And we clearly see on the right for some, which is just scenario two, so the dashed lines uh, in the previous slide, that this has also an influence in terms of the path uh, choices. So next, and this of course has an influence again in the traffic dynamics because on MFD, um, if you have, um, if you flatten the demand, so if you have less vehicles traveling in your uh, network, you have fewer accumulation, vehicles will be allowed to travel at a higher speed and they will uh, finish their trips in the region uh, faster as well. Because on MFD, if you have a region, uh, if you add one vehicle, automatically the average speed uh, decreases. And what you see here is that 
So as we expected, the traffic dynamics for scenario one, so it's which is demand one, it's when we have our network in more free flow conditions. Um, we don't observe many changes as we were expecting from our previous uh, analysis in the previous slides. And as the network becomes more conjectured, then we have a clear, re a clear reduction in the uh, conjunction in the city, uh, which we see, for example, in region one, we have clearly a, a peak around that goes until more or less 2000 vehicles for the user equilibrium without the modeling of activities. And when we include the, the calculation of the departure time choice equilibrium, the peak of conjunction just basically decreases. And this also shows why it is important to account for uh, demand features and demand modeling on MFT. Uh, do you want to add something here, Guido? No, um, I think it's uh, uh, you said everything. I just want to stress maybe what you just said that uh, the, I think the main difference is, is obvious in this slide because now uh, beyond looking at all the different plots, you can clearly see that when we have the activity base situation, uh, you have a reduction in the demand and you have as well that the, the duration of the congestion expand, which once again, it means that there is a different utilization of the infrastructure. And that's the key element on in considering this dimension of this temporal dimension, that otherwise it's not, uh, if lost, it can bring to really wrong congestion patterns. Next slide. So here we started to we model a sequence of activities that happen. Uh, so we have uh, a total of nine uh, OD pairs, a total of 20 paths. And we again see that um, when we apply these uh, activity based uh, modeling departure time and uh, path choices compared to a case in which we don't um, basically we just calculate this equilibrium, so the equilibrium without the modeling of activities, that we again observe the flattening of the peaks, especially on the OD pairs where you have more demand traveling. And this is always, uh, so the, these peaks are always flattening around the desired uh, peak for the travel time or, or around the desired peak for the desired departure time. So this of course has an influence if you go to the next slide. Yeah, just maybe one comment uh, yeah. that uh, for those who wonder this uh, pointy shape of the demand is actually related to the decision we made about utility functions. Mm -hmm. And we we on purpose wanted to have a very strong penalty for arriving late on, on early. And that's why we had this shape. And even in this case, you can see that when you reach equilibrium, when there is congestion, the demand has the tendency to spread in a much more realistic way. So uh, this is actually two things. The first thing is that uh, the, the decision of the utility function you use and its parameters is of course really crucial in these parameters because otherwise we go back to, as we said before, we are transferring a lot of complexity from the demand to the utility functions. But if these are not properly calibrated, then of course the, the problem stays. So that that's has to be always important. So again, we observe a reduction uh, also in the um, conjunction in the city, uh, as we have observed also in our previous uh, scenario. And more importantly, if you move on to the next uh, slide, uh, we can also model chains of activities. As you see here on this uh, uh, OD33, we have just here two uh, bimodal peak for the desired departure time. So this is just a sequence of activities. And we just have one activity for the other uh, OD pairs. And we clearly see that as we increase the complexity also in our modeling, in, in our model, when we, have, when we are modeling um, chains of activities, uh, the, the flattening of the curve, uh, not only, not only uh, not, the model not only changes the flattening of the curve, but also the shape of it. And you clearly observe this for uh, this uh, OD33 uh, in the equilibrium uh, demand. So this, of course, if you go to the next uh, slide, has an influence again on the traffic dynamics. Uh, by so basically, it reduces the overall conjunction in the network compared to the standard uh, user equilibrium. And arriving to the end, if you go to the next, uh, to the outline of the presentation, so basically here, 
we have designed uh, a utility-based uh, dynamic traffic assignment model for uh, MFT models and uh, regional networks. We have discussed some uh, implementations of this work, uh, considering uh, different kinds of activities and uh, demand scenarios. And we mainly see that, in general, the MFD, uh, or in general, this framework can be a good alternative to the classical bottleneck model, uh, to also to include more realistic and dynamic uh, travel times uh, in the modeling of activities. As the next steps, so we will uh, include also in this modeling the departure time, the, the mode choice, uh, and also to um, we will introduce more realistic uh, utility functions uh, in the departure time to, to be able to reproduce uh, more complex mobility patterns. So with this, if you want to add something here, Guido. Yeah, just one, one comment that, of course, one other thing that we, we, we will have probably to take care is a better integration between the models. I'm sure you mentioned yeah. that. But of course, now we have a, a sequence of model. So we have the, the root choice, and then we have the, the, the departure time choice. So ideally, we want to consider the, the joint choice of root and departure time. And I think that's it from my side. Yeah. Oh, that you. wasn't too long. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. So we are happy to answer questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Guido and Sergio, for your interesting presentation. And I know it's too late. It's almost 10 p.m. in Europe. And you're great to present in our webinar series. Thank you so much for that. So with all that said, uh, we are now open for questions from the audience. If Should I stop sharing? Are there no. uh, maybe we can leave if there are questions yeah. from this, I mean, about on one specific slide. Makes sense. Yeah, let's see if you have any questions, you can just raise your hand. I don't know whether the raise hand is open here, or you can just unmute yourself or you can write down your question in the chat section. So before, so let's see if anyone has a question. So I have a few questions myself, like, can you please go to slide 32? Yeah. So here I see like, yeah, I've divided the network into four zones. So is that partitioning static or dynamic? So that's... The, the, uh, your question has different angles. So mm -hmm. first, uh, I, will, I will comment on the fact that this is a static uh, partitioning. Mm -hmm. uh, and this partitioning actually accounts for geographical features, which is between region two, three, so the north part of the city, and region one and four, you have just the in-river that travels uh, basically between these regions. And between region one and four, actually it's the, the railway uh, road, the basically the, the station, it's somewhere in the middle. Actually it's in, in this, th there is a huge gap between region one and the region four, if you see. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go down, down, no, no, down, no, left. Yeah. Left. Th yeah. There is just in the middle, like a white gap, in, that is the train station four. between one and four. Mm -hmm. oh, for here. So yeah. yeah, exactly that. It's a train station. So mm -hmm. this partitioning took, took into account also for the connections. So basically the connectors between the regions. And of course, between mm -hmm. two and three, I just decided to do the to do the the, the 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 partitioning there because we only have two connectors. I think that it makes sense uh, in this way. Mm -hmm. So this means that the partitioning does not account uh for um traffic features and does not account uh or, or for traffic features in the sense that we don't know if the traffic conditions are homogeneous so this is the first point the other point is the fact that uh, should we really consider dynamic partitioning for mfd i do not think so mm -hmm. So there are actual like physical boundaries between those four regions, right? Yeah. 
as a separator. So, and the estimation of those MFTs, like, have you done like simulations or? No, I just did one yeah. estimation yeah. for the critical and the, the gem, the, so the, the gem uh -huh. uh, accumulation based on the network. So basically, basically based on the network. total network length. Mm -hmm. And then they are ordered. So if you see in terms of the size of the regions, the sort of smallest yeah. in there is region one, so it, which will be the one that has a lower uh, critical production and accumulation, and then they increase. This is because we don't have uh, also ac access to, for example, GPS uh, data on to calibrate these MFTs. Yeah. And on the other hand, if you would be running also microscopic simulations here to estimate the MFDs, why would we use after MFD, right? So this mm -hmm. it's coming back to the question, uh, why we want to use MFD. So yeah. this is still a research question on MFD. And you also did some work in this direction on how to properly estimate the MFDs and it's still a research question. Awesome, thank you so much for your answer. And like, do you have any specific way to treat the boundary cues there? Like, do you have, do you like assume like there are point cues at the boundaries of those regions or like you don't consider so like any specific here cue? we modeled um, all the dynamics using the accumulation based uh, model. And we follow exactly the traffic dynamics as described uh, in Marriott uh, et al. 2019, mm -hmm. the PR Part B uh, paper, which considers for, so after uh, the critical accumulation, you start to have some uh, restrictions, so some boundary restrictions and all the, all the dynamics that, uh, so basically there will be a competition between demand and supply uh, and all of this it's described in Marriott et al. Thank you so much. And like, so if the network also... is not conjectured, then you don't have mm -hmm. the, these restrictions that apply. As the network yeah, yeah. becomes more conjectured, then you start to have uh, mm -hmm. these restrictions. Yeah. So can you also please go to slide 36? Yeah. Three. 36? Okay, that's ah, yeah. yeah that, so that's the, the like the diagram at top shows the desired demand and the one at the bottom shows the equilibrium demand which your model gives you right demand. So, yeah. but it has a change like the ODs. Like, is there any change in the ODs or like like do you cap the demand or? So, thank you. No, so in this case, basically, the desired demand is basically how the demand will look like if you have infinite capacity. So basically, if travel times are zero for all or, 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 or free flow travel time, and every user could choose independently, basically, from all the others, that would be the desired demand. Uh, of course, this doesn't happen. So the difference in the equilibrium is just that the, you will have a lot of people competing, for instance, for this time of the day at nine o'clock and a lot of people competing at eight o'clock. And of course, what you observe is that because of this competition, basically some of the pairs will spread along the day. And specifically, you can see this one is the O3D2, for instance, is the most heavily penalized, I'll say. Yeah. And you have also, you can also see the effect, the asymmetric effect of, in this case, uh, arriving early or arriving late is not the same. We didn't talk about it, but actually you have um, scheduling delay, which means you have different penalty for arriving late or arriving early compared to your preferred arrival time. And because here we are modeling the morning commute, uh, we say that the penalty of arriving late is much higher, which is why you observe a lot of more people shifting before rather than late. And you can also see that for other OD pairs, for instance, like OD4, D2, you actually don't see much difference. And this is once again related, of course, to, to the combined effect of route choice and departure time for different utility functions. Not all the, which was exactly what we were modeling. 
for some user, the penalty of arriving late or maybe stacking congestion is different. So they will eventually not change their behavior, which is what we want to show here. So thank you for your answer. So the area like below each of those OD curves in the top and bottom figures are the same. Yes, right? the number of people is the same. You have just that the users are changing their departure. You just adjust the departure time. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And so we have a question in the chat section. I'll just ask you about that, whichever of you wants to answer and go ahead and answer. Like, uh, they're, they're asking that, could you please elaborate the meaning of the graphs of slide 35? Why does the top line of graphs look symmetric to the bottom line of the graphs? Yeah, because the, so this is related with the, so on top we have the evolution of the accumulation of vehicles, basically the number of vehicles traveling at different time instants and the, uh, the mean speed that you observe on the bottom is related with uh, the accumulation. So um, if you add one vehicle in the region, the mean, the mean speed will decrease uh, automatically because the mean speed actually relates with the travel production. It's basically just a ratio between the travel production and the accumulation. So what we observe here is that uh, as we have more conjunction, so as we are increasing the accumulation in region one, uh, the average speed decreases proportionally, so roughly proportionally. To the so same. they're related. The yeah. Bottom yeah. graphs are the average speed and they're related to the accumulation. Yeah. So that's why they look similar. And, uh, yeah. Thank you for your answer. So if there are any questions, any other questions, let's see. So it seems like that we don't have any further questions. So I'd like to thank you again, Sergio and Guido for your interesting presentation. Although I need to mention this again, it's too late in Europe right now in your grid to do this at this time. Thank you so much. Hope to see you again soon, either virtually or in person. And Thank you so much, everyone who attended this seminar. See you soon in our next seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Have a nice Thank rest you. of the day then. <laughs>